Thank you all for joining us today, and thank to our, thanks to our excellent speakers, Rebecca, Christian, Corinne. Wonderful presentations again, and thank you to the Human Synergistics Group here in Australia and New Zealand for 20 years of conferences. Again, it's a pleasure to be with you. I always enjoy coming over to Australia and presenting both here and in Melbourne. I'm presenting on something a little bit different for me. Usually I uh, focus on things like uh, the How Culture Works model and how leadership impact uh, works out. Uh, I asked to come up with something that was that culture. The thing that came first to my mind, given how frequently I read about culture nowadays in the newspapers and hear about it on uh, various media, I decided to go with collateral damage. We see it all the time, these organizations that I'm familiar with in the United States, apparently here in Australia and other countries as well, keep making the headlines. And as you get uh, into the text of the articles, it's uh, about the collateral damage that they have um, caused given something that they have done. And I'm finding more and more, almost invariably, it's uh, attributed to their culture. There's no explanation for that, but somehow collateral damage nowadays is linked in the media to culture. Oftentimes, um, they're apparently right. There is a relationship between organizational culture and collateral damage, but uh, it's treated in a very superficial way. I only have 15 or 20 minutes today, but I want to begin getting into the relationship between organizational culture and collateral damage in a somewhat more meaningful way, hopefully, and in a way that um, eventually will enable us to work with organizations and specifically reduce the likelihood, the probabilities, and the severity of collateral damage. So this is what we're talking about today, both damage and organizational culture. On the collateral damage side, the, um, the original definition of it is sort of like the first half of the top line that I have. It's a definition out of the military. And it talks about, um, or it refers to damage that is sort of associated with um, strikes, with mission, and the like, that um, damage has been expected and calculated to some extent, but can't be avoided. In the vernacular, in the press, nowadays in organizational settings, collateral damage also includes unanticipated and sometimes unintentional damage as a result of actions and decisions made by the organization. And we'll be talking about both types of those today, but uh, much of it is unanticipated. Organizational culture, it's our standard definition, a system of shared values and beliefs that can lead to norms and expectations that guide the way that members of the organization approach their work, interact with others, and solve problems. First, collateral damage. I, I've been trying to sort of categorize the different types of collateral damage that we're seeing as a result of organizational culture, organizational leadership, and other forces within organizations and similar bodies. And this is sort of a, uh, a starting uh, set of categories. In other words, I'm looking here at the targets, unfortunately, the recipients of collateral damage caused by organizations. In many cases, it's, it's at the societal level, uh, either country, a community, uh, location, regional area. It can be ecological, it can be damage to the ecology, the physical environment. It can be damage around national security due to banks and other organizations indirectly providing funds and materiel to countries that really shouldn't have those assets. It can be political, it can be in terms of trade. 
Often, though, the people who are damaged are the clients of the organization, which seems sort of strange. But nowadays, it does appear that many organizations make decisions and embark on programs and policies that um, are detrimental to their clients, either from a financial perspective, health perspective, their satisfaction, or their well-being. Similarly, a um, major category of uh, damages employees, the people who work for the organizations creating the damage. And again, it's the same set of dimensions of financial health, satisfaction, and well-being. I'm also including members as a, another inadvertent target of collateral damage. And the distinction between members and employees is not always clear. But I'm using members here in the sense that um, the people affected are, for example, members of teams, members of Olympic teams. We've had issues around that recently in the United States, students, members of churches, members of voluntary organizations, et cetera. And here, uh, the damage is somewhat similar, unfortunately, to the damage suffered by certain employees. Uh, also, however, disturbingly, because in many cases, the members are young people, there are long-lasting and downstream effects of the damage. Probably the most unexpected recipients of collateral damage are the organizations and organizational members themselves who are inadvertently or unconsciously creating the damage. And the damage comes financially, it comes in terms of penalties, it comes in terms of the reputation of the organization, and also the people singled out for creating the damage suffer as well, and sometimes it's in terms of losing their job, sometimes it's in terms of fees and penalties, or other, other types of negative consequences. The, the culture of organizations, you've probably seen this, I use this in a lot of my presentations, has various consequences. Culture is related to outcomes, and as I've said many times, the outcomes associated with a positive, constructive culture usually are desired, they're valued outcomes, they are positive outcomes. In contrast, uh, the outcomes associated with passive cultures are much more negative, uh, ineffective, lack of satisfaction, and the like. Most complicated ones, the most complicated set of outcomes associated with organizational culture are due to aggressive, defensive cultural norms and expectations. And some of the outcomes are positive, but others are quite negative. They tend to be somewhat unpredictable. They send, tend to be somewhat volatile. They change from one point in time to the next. And they also differ across criteria of effectiveness. But what I'm trying to say today is that cultures that are aggressive can sometimes lead to temporary, very good, even exceptional performance in certain cases. But they are offset by events, incidents, consequences that are, are totally negative and really sort of counteract, and in some cases more than counteract, the positive consequences. Cultural moral development. Interestingly, I have found that the cultural circumplex that, that we've developed and used is related to certain theories of ethics and moral development in individuals. And I'm just going to share it to you because the rest of my presentation sort of focuses on the, the ethical consequences and the ethical aspects of the circumplex styles. The initial way that young people get into ethics is they sort of do what they're told to do. They obey and they do things to avoid punishment. As they get a little bit older, they get into ethics from an instrumental perspective and start making decisions on the basis of 
what gets them what they want. It's sort of an obnoxious period, but uh, they, they all go through that. Uh, then as they get a little bit older, they get into things like uh, the nice boy, nice girl syndrome, you know, behaving, being good, as we call it. And also, it's technically called law and order, but following rules, and following rules as closely as possible. It's not until later in life that people graduate to the highest level of uh, moral thinking, and they get into things like social contract and relationships that uh, are somewhat transactional, but do in fact benefit both parties. At the highest level, though, you have the universal ethical principles like the golden rule, uh, respect for others, taking into consideration consequences of decisions for everyone who may be affected by the decision. Those two latter ones, five and six, are consistent with what we call the constructive styles. A number of years ago, I started writing an ethics survey. Um, no one wanted it. No one took the survey. It's sort of like spending a lot of time and money on a party, and no one shows up. I did this um, after the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation in the United States, and there was a seeming interest in ethics. But um, take my advice, don't ever try and sell an ethics survey. <laughs> the, the good part is I still have the items I wrote, and I basically wrote these items to supplement or go along with the items I wrote for the organizational culture inventory. And I wrote about four items for each style that take the style and translate it into expectations for behaviors that have ethical implications and have to do with moral reasoning. Here you have the aggressive defensive cultural styles. So style seven sort of explains why banks sell mortgages to people who can't afford those mortgages. It's sort of a cynical approach to doing business and to working with your clients. Unfortunately, they put those clients sort of into positions of bankruptcy and lose them as clients. But for a while, it seems to be a good thing. Power, relying on power and status, having these great power differentials in organizations that often slip over into non-work type situations and create very uncomfortable relationships for people within organizations. Competitive, succeed at the expense of others, um, open up accounts for people that they don't need just to uh, do better than your competition in the financial services industry. Perfectionistic, having extremely high goals to reach and trying very hard to meet them in any way possible, including, for example, putting emissions defeat devices into diesel engine cars in order to reach the organizational goals. Each of these translates into difficult situations that either propel questionable decision making in organizations or provide individual members sort of with the implicit support to be able to get away with questionable practices. Ethical transgressions Questionable decisions, questionable actions, I feel are usually the result of aggressive defensive norms in organizations. But something else happens when you have organizations with a generalized defensive culture. And that is that no one does anything about it. And the problem persists, in some cases, for years. And that is due to the fact that in those organizations, Passive norms are also strong. In contrast, the constructive styles operate to reduce the likelihood of ethical transgressions and difficult decisions in organizations. So you're a bank, you look at a loan program in terms of how much money it's going to make for the bank. And if certain people default, well, that's OK. It's built into your interest rates and your progressions. With a constructive style, 
you also look in a humanistic way at the effects of a default, for example, on the individuals going through it. And you approach the situation in a much more careful way than if you were just looking at it aggressively. Cultures with um, collateral damage potential. When cultures start becoming more defensive, both passive and aggressive, than these profiles and less constructive, they have collateral damage potential. And in these cases, when you have an organization with profiles that are more extreme than this, they sort of can't believe it and sort of look at it as something that's apart from them. But an expression I used the other day, the reaction I want them to have is, we are facing the enemy and he is us. It's a famous quote from Pogo. The reason for that is because they are the culture. The culture is simply something that exists in their mind. And it's ultimately up to them to change the culture and in the meantime to make sure it does not translate into collateral damage situations. With banks in the United States and elsewhere in the world, I used to use profiles very early on. We even used different colors for the styles years ago. And banks had normal cultures. They had cultures that if you put a bunch of 25 banks together, the profile was sort of circular. Yes, some of the banks would be very defensive out of those 25, but some would also be very constructive. And they would sort of balance each other out and um, have a normal profile. Over the past 10, 15 years, banks have moved as an industry from sort of normal circular cultures to cultures that are systematically more defensive than they are constructive. It's a cycle, however, it's a very long cycle, and it's due to a number of factors that keep reoccurring and reinforcing the tendency toward aggressive behaviors and the rewards for aggressive behaviors in banks. These factors I've listed here are mainly from the United States, but I know there are similarities to these factors throughout the world, particularly with respect to things like mortgages, which started in the US in the early 2000s, innocently to help people who really couldn't afford housing to buy housing, but it, uh, it became very profitable for banks to do it and uh, they sort of went overboard in the, in the quest. Another banking slide, this one from our Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It shows, um, I think it was 2016 and a number of quarters prior to that, how many complaints were received about banks that had um, either open up fake accounts for their individual consumers, or they had uh, reneged on promises regarding promotions, or charged people too much for late fees, et cetera. And you can see that um, the numbers are quite high. What I want to point out, though, on this slide is you can't always predict what bank is going to pay for it with aggressive behaviors and collateral damage, unusual things happen. Here, in this particular case, and I'm still trying to figure out why, the only bank that was really punished for it with the $200 million fine was Wells Fargo. The other banks were punished for other things, but I'm not sure they were punished to the same extent. And this is a way of, of communicating that one has to be very careful with aggressive cultures and the things that they lead to because you never know when your behavior is going to be singled out for punishment and retribution, so to speak. Also, with this kind of behavior, you can be sure that if the organizations in your industry keep engaging in the behaviors, the industry will end up being regulated by governments and that can lead actually to further problems down the road. 
very quickly. I am running out of time, so I'm going to do this again. Just want to reiterate that the aggressive styles in organizations are responsible for initiating these kinds of problems that lead to collateral damage. But again, because of passive norms in such organizations, those behaviors go unchecked. And it almost seems that they're covered up intentionally. In some cases, they are. In other cases, it's simply because members are afraid to do anything about it. Yes, damage can also start from the other side of the circumplex, the passive styles, specifically around the inappropriate application of rules. We've had a number of situations where units of organizations have treated people unfairly, usually clients, because they got carried away with the rules. And it was never intended to happen, but it did happen and is then sustained by the organization having an aggressive culture or a culture that is too weak with respect to the constructive norms. Finally, moving forward and trying to get away from the damage, though much more thinking and much more research and much more discussion is needed. First, and I guess most apparent, is generically try to move the cultures of organizations away from passive and aggressive styles and into the more constructive clusters. That will not only increase organizational effectiveness generically, but it will also reduce the likelihood that the organization will end up inadvertently or sometimes knowingly causing collateral damage. Second, use confidential measures so that organizations can get feedback on what's going on ethically within their organizations. You want leaders to know this, but they are, they are reluctant to use valid measures because those measures might get them in trouble. So they can't get information right now on what they need in order to make changes. Reward employees on the basis of true criteria of effectiveness. In other words, reward employees for true achievement for behaving constructively, not for looking good, not for the aggressive styles, and don't allow either doing good or looking good to compensate for discretions when evaluating employees, particularly high-level people. Finally, I know there are review boards here in the United States for risk, but I do feel that in both countries we should look at organizational review boards that are patterned after what we call institutional review boards that um, provide medical schools, hospitals, other biomedical research organizations on advice and regulation regarding decisions around human subject protection in research. Those are the recommendations. I actually do want to do more thinking on this topic, but this is the beginning, and it was a pleasure sharing it with you today. And again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.